all right, we are going to start chapter two. And chapter two is called breakup. Okay. So there's the definition. Okay. Dissolution of a unit, an organization, or a group of organizations. The Justice Department sometimes forces the breakup of a large corporation into several smaller companies. Okay, so we'll see how that definition, um, how it fits into this chapter. So um, if you want to write about why, after we read the chapter, why you think this chapter was called Breakup on your dojo portfolio, that would be awesome. Or the little questions to the side, the think about things, you can also talk about those in your portfolio. We'd love to see your answers on there. Okay, so what you're going to think about is how does the narrator's perspective change from the first chapter that we read to this chapter that we're going to read right now. Okay, so think about the narrator. The narrator is a person telling the story. So think about who you think the narrator is. And then whose point of view are they focused on in the first chapter? And how does that change to the second chapter? Whose point of view are they focused on in the second chapter? Okay, so think about that. And then what evidence do you have to support what you think. Okay, so like I said, you can answer those on your portfolio if you would like to. We'd love to see your answers. All right, we're going to start chapter two. Jessie didn't get it. She just didn't get it. What was Evan's problem? He'd been acting like a weirdo for two days now, and it was two days ago that the letter had arrived. But why would he be so upset about that letter? This is a puzzle, Jessie told herself, and I'm good at puzzles. But it was a puzzle about feelings, and Jessie knew that feelings were her weakest subject. Jessie sat in the cool darkness of the basement and thought back to Monday, the day the letter had come. Everything had been normal. She and Evan were putting together a lemonade stand in the driveway when the mailman walked up and handed Jessie a bundle of letters. Evan never bothered to look at the mail, but Jessie was always entering contests and expecting to win. So she flipped through the letters right away. Boring, 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 said Jessie at each letter, as each letter flashed by. Hey, something from school, addressed to mom. She held it up a plain white envelope. What do you think it is? Dunno, said Evan. He was in the garage uncovering a small wooden table they usually used for a stand. It was buried under two snow tubes, two boogie boards, and the garden hose. Jesse watched while Evan gave a mighty pull and lifted the table up over his head. Wow, he's gotten so big, thought Jesse, remembering what Mom had said about Evan's growth spurt. Sometimes Jesse felt like Evan was growing twice as fast as she was. Growing up? Growing away. It looks important, said Jesse. It looks like bad news, is what she thought in her head. Was there a problem? A complaint? A mix-up? All the nervousness she'd been feeling about skipping to fourth grade suddenly burbled up inside her. This table's really dirty, said Evan. Do you think we can just cover it with a lot of cups and the pitcher and no one will notice? Jessie looked. The table was streaked with black. No, Evan groaned. I'll clean it said Jessie. Evan had only agreed to have a lemonade stand because it was one of her favorite things to do. The least she could do for him was clean the gunk off the table. Maybe, she said, holding up the envelope again, they're postponing school. Maybe the first day isn't going to be next Tuesday, you think? That caught Evan's attention. Let's ask mom to open it up, he said. Up in the humming cool of her office, Mrs. Tresky read the letter through once. Well, she said, this is a curveball. She looked right at Evan. Jessie thought her face looked worried. Evan, you and Jessie are going to be in the same class this year. You'll both have Mrs. Overton. Jessie felt relief flood her entire body. The same class? If she could have wished for one thing in the whole world, that's what she would have wished for. She would be with Evan, and Evan would make everything easier. 
He would introduce her to all those fourth graders. He would show them all that she was okay. Not some puny second grader who didn't really belong. But Evan didn't look happy. He looked angry. Why? He asked in an almost shouting voice. Mrs. Tresky scanned a letter. Well, the classes were small to start with. And now some of the fourth graders they thought would be attending aren't because they're moving or switching to private schools. So they need to combine the two small classes into one bigger class. This is so unfair, said Evan. I want to miss Scobie. And I don't want... He looked at Jesse. This is so unfair. Jesse was surprised. This was great news. Why didn't Evan see that? They always had fun together at home. Now they could have fun in school, too. It'll be fun, she said to Evan. It will not be fun, said Evan. School isn't fun. And he stomped downstairs and locked himself in his room for the rest of the afternoon. They never finished the lemonade stand. And here it was, two days later, and Evan was still all locked up. Even though he wasn't in his room, he wouldn't talk to her and he wouldn't play with her. So Jessie went up to her room and did what she always did when she was upset or angry or sad or confused. She started reading Charlotte's Web. She had read that book about a hundred times. She was at the good part, the happy part. Wilbur had just been named some pig. And he was getting all kinds of attention from the Zuckermans and the whole town. But Jessie couldn't settle into the happy feeling the one that usually came when Charlotte said, I dare say my trip will work and Wilbur's life will be, can be saved. And says she kept noticing that unhappy feeling tap, tap, tapping on her shoulder. And it wasn't the unhappy feeling that came from knowing that Charlotte was going to die on page 171. It was Evan. She couldn't stop thinking about what he had said. Jesse could only remember one other time that Evan had said, I hate you to her. Grandma had been over and Evan needed help with his math homework. He had that frustrated, screwed up mouth look that he sometimes got with math or spelling or writing reports. Mom called it, he's a gonna blow look, but Grandma couldn't help him because it was all Greek to her. So Jesse had shown him how to do each problem. Well, she just sort of jumped in and done the problems for him. That wasn't helping, was it? Grandma was called her a girl genius, but Evan had ripped his paper in half and run upstairs shouting, I hate you, just before slamming his door. That was last year. Jessie rested the book on her stomach and stared at the ceiling. People were confusing. She'd rather do a hundred math problems than try to figure out someone else's mixed up feelings any day of the week. That's why she and Evan got along so well. He'd just tell her straight out, I'm mad at you because you ate the last Rice Krispie Street. And then she could say, sorry, hey, I've got some Starburst in my room. You want them? And that would be that. Evan was a straight shooter, not like the girls at school, the ones who had started that club. She rolled over onto her side to get away from those thoughts. Across the room, against the opposite wall, she noticed the three pieces of foam core her mom had bought for Jessie's Labor, Labor Day project. Every year, the Rotary Club sponsored a competition for kids to see who could come up with the best display related to the holiday. This was the first year Jessie was old enough to participate, and she had begged her mom to buy foam core and gel pens and fluorescent paper and special stickers for her display. She was determined to win the prize money, a hundred dollars, but she hadn't been able to come up with a single idea that seemed good enough. So here it was, just five days before the competition, and the phone core was still completely blank. Jessie reached for her book. She didn't want to think about the girls at school, and she didn't want to think about the competition. She started reading again. Wilbur and Charlotte, Charlotte were at the fair and Charlotte was beginning to show her age. Jessie read the words that Wilbur said to his best friend. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte. Perhaps if you spun a web and catch a couple of flies, 
you'll feel better. Well, the second part didn't apply at all, but Jessie imagined herself saying the first line. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Evan. It sounded about right. At least it would show him that she cared. And Jessie knew that this was important when someone was feeling upset. She decided to go downstairs and give it a try. She would do just about anything to get Evan back to the way he was before the letter. Jessie looked in the kitchen and the backyard. No Evan. She was halfway down the steps to the basement when she heard a noise coming from the garage. She opened the door and felt the full heat of the day on her skin. It was like some giant had blown his hot, stinky breath on her. In the garage, she found Evan and Scott Spencer. Weird, she thought. Evan doesn't even like Scott Spencer. They'd been on-again, off-again friends from kindergarten. But ever since Scott had purposefully put Evan's bike helmet under the wheel of the Tresky's minivan so that Miss Tresky ran over it when she backed out, the friendship had definitely been off. Jessie looked from Evan to Scott and back again. Now she had no idea what to say. I'm awfully sorry to hear you're feeling poorly, Evan. Didn't seem to make much sense when Evan was obviously having fun with his friend. She tried to think of something else to say. All she could do was come up with, what are you doing? The boys were bent over a piece of cardboard. Evan was writing letters with a skinny red felt-tipped pen. The purple cooler was in the middle of the garage, and the two plastic chairs were stacked on top of it. On the top chair was a brown paper bag. Nothing, said Evan, not looking up. Jesse walked over to the boys and peered over Evan's shoulder. Lemonade, 50 cents. She said, you spelled lemonade wrong. It's an O, not an I. But she thought, oh good, a lemonade stand, my favorite thing to do. The boys didn't say anything. Jesse saw Evan's mouth tighten up. You want me to make the lemonade? She asked. Already made, said Evan. I could decorate the sign. She said, I'm good at drawing butterflies and flowers and things. Scott snored. <laughs> we don't want girl stuff like that on our sign. Do you want to use my lockbox to keep the money in? It's got a tray with separate compartments for all the different coins. Nope, said Evan, still working on the sign. Well, she said, looking around, I can clean the table for you. The small wooden table, still covered in black streaks, was pushed up against the bikes. We're not using it, said Evan. But we always use the table for a stand, said Jessie. Evan pushed his face in, his, in her direction. We don't want it. Jessie took a couple of steps back. Her insides felt runny, like a fried egg that hasn't cooked enough. She knew she should just go back into the house, but for some reason her legs wouldn't move. She stood still, her bare feet rooted to the cool cement. Scott whispered something to Evan, and the two of the boys laughed. Two boys laughed, low and mean. Jessie swayed toward the door, but her feet stayed planted. She couldn't stand it that Evan wanted to be with Scott. He was a real jerk, more than her. Hey, she said. I bet you need change. I've got a ton. You could have all my change. You know, as long as you pay it back at the end of the day. Don't need it, said Evan. Yeah, you do, insisted Jessie. You always need change, especially in the beginning. You'll lose cells if you can't make change. Evan clapped the pen with a loud snap and stuck it in his pocket. Scott's bankrolling us. His mom keeps a change jar, so we've got plenty. The boy stood up. Evan held the sign for Scott to read, turning his back to Jesse. Awesome, said Scott. Jesse knew that the sign was not awesome. The letters were too small and thin to read from a distance. Evan should have used a fat marker instead of a skinny felt tip pen. Everybody knew that. There weren't any pretty decorations to attract customers, and the word lemonade was spelled wrong. Why would Evan take a wouldn't why wouldn't Evan take a little help from her? She just wanted to help. Scott turned to her and said, 
Are you really going to be in fourth grade this year? Jessie's back stiffened. Yep, she said. Wow, that is so freaky. It's not, she said, sticking her chin out. It's two, said Scott. I mean, you're a second grader and now you're going to be a fourth grader? That's just messed up. Jesse looked at Evan, but he was busy taping the sign to the cooler. Lots of people skip grades, said Jesse. It's not that big of a deal. It's completely weird, said Jesse. I mean, you miss everything from a whole year. You miss a whole unit on Antarctica, Antarctica, and that was the best. And the field trip to the aquarium, and the thing where we sent letters all over the country. Remember that, Evan? You got a letter from Alaska. That was so cool. Evan nodded but he didn't look up. It's not that big of a deal, said Jessie again. Her voice stretched tight like a rubber band. It's like you miss a year of your life, Scott said. It's like you're going to die a whole year earlier than the rest of us because you never had third grade. Jessie felt cold and hot at the same time. Part of her wanted to yell, that doesn't make any sense, but the other part of her felt so freakish, like Scott had just noticed she had three legs. Evan stood up and tossed the paper bag to Scott. Then he grabbed the plastic chairs with one hand. Come on, let's go. He reached down to grab one handle of the cooler. Scott grabbed the other, and together they lifted it and began to walk out of the garage. Hey, Evan, said Jesse, calling to their backs. Can I come too? No, he said without turning around. Come on, please. I'll be a big help. I can do lots of things. You're too young, he said sharply. You're just a baby. The boys walked out. You're just a baby. Jesse couldn't believe Evan had said that. After all the stuff they'd done together, and he was only 14 months older than she was, hardly even a full year. She was about to yell back something really harsh, something stinging and full of bite, like, Oh, yeah, when she heard Scott say to Evan, Man, I can't believe you have to be in the same class as your little sister. If that happened to me, I'd move to South America. Yeah, tell me about it, replied Evan, crossing the street. The words died on Jessie's lips. She watched Evan walking away, getting smaller and smaller. He was deserting her. He wasn't going to stand by her at school. He wasn't going to smooth the way for her. He wasn't going to be on the other side with all of them looking down on her, telling everyone that she was too young to be part of the crowd, telling everyone that she didn't belong. Fine for you, Evan Tresky, she said as she marched into the house, her fist balled up at her sides. I don't need you. I don't need you to have fun. I don't need you to run a lemonade stand. And I don't need you to make friends in the fourth grade. Halfway up the stairs, she stomped and shouted, and I'm not a baby. Okay, so that was end of chapter two. Remember that chapter was called Breakup. So do you think that was a good title for that chapter? Tell me about it on your portfolio.